soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. <clears throat> Smile a while and give your face a rest. Say hello to the ones you love the best. Then shake hands with someone nearby and give the world a smile. Miguel didn't smile, so I'm going to sing right to him. You find somebody else to sing to. Smile a while and give your face a rest. Say hello to the ones you love the best. Then shake hands with someone nearby and give the world a smile. Isn't it just fun to smile? Sometimes you just smile at people just to see what they'll just to see what they'll do, just to catch them off guard. I remember one time, you know. This is a couple of years ago, but I flew back out to Kansas with my family, and uh, we were going to see my wife's side of the family. And uh, we got into this. We stopped to get a drink at a gas station, and I walked in. And this guy, I remember, in, we're in Kansas. We're in the Midwest, and country, everybody's friendly to everybody. I wasn't used to that in Philly. You know, people in Philly, we just kind of walk with our heads down, focused. So I walk into this gas station, and the guy's like, hey, how's it going today? I was like, great, thinking, why are you talking to me? And then I remembered, oh, wait, I can be friendly. We're in a friendly part of the country. <laughs> not that Philly's not friendly. You know, we're just, people are in the, the bustle. They're in the hustle and bustle and walking around. And, you know, they, uh, they keep their, their focus. Do what? Yeah. Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Good to see everybody this morning. It's going to be a great, great day. And uh, we'll jump in here this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a good week that you gave us this last week. And Father, I pray that you would bless us here today. Uh, thank you for the Sunday school time. Thank you for our young people being in here this morning. I pray that we would all get something. God, I pray that you'd speak to my heart uh, through the lesson this morning. And uh, while I, I have the privilege to teach, Lord, uh, I've got nothing on anybody. Uh, we're all in this together. We're all trying to, to uh, be the best Christians that we can be. And so I pray that you would teach all of us this morning. Thank you for the Word of God and the lessons that we can get from it. I pray for Bible Baptist this morning that you bless the service over there. Lord, be with those that might still be traveling into church today. I pray that you give them safety. May we have a wonderful day in your house. And Lord, thank you for the folks that are here, the spirit that's already here. Uh, may we bless your name today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. And uh, we'll take some prayer requests as normal. And so if you have an update on anything... You can let us know that, uh, or if you have something new that you'd like to add to it, uh, feel free. Uh, so anybody, okay, there we go. I thought I looked right at her and smiled, and she turned around and walked away. I thought, boy, you know, I, I did brush my teeth this morning. It is good to see you. <laughs> uh, anybody with a prayer request? Don't scratch your nose. I think you raise your hand. <laughs> Ito. Okay, keep praying for Joe's daughter and uh, needs a kidney transplant there, and so just continue to pray for her. Anybody else? Bob. Bob's finally taking a day off. I see Bob is a hard, hard worker, uh, working around his neighborhood, does some scrapping, I'm sure, does some other things, and every time I see him, man, he is busy, and so he's taking a day off tomorrow, and so pray for Bob to have safety, traveling down there uh, and back, and uh, I know that'll be a blessing. Sometimes you just need some some R&R. Say, what is R&R? &R? Rest and relaxation, and so sometimes you got to get it. Anybody else with a prayer request? All right. Well, let's pray for these and uh, mention a few others. Uh, keep praying for Brother Cordell. Still waiting on a surgery date, right, Brother Cordell? Okay. All right. All right. So you got an appointment on the 8th to determine then when to uh, have the open heart or the bypass surgery there. Yep. Keep praying for Rick, uh, pastor's brother down there in Texas with cancer. Uh, no, sorry. You're wearing a coat. I'm hot. So um, keep praying for Miss Lynn and her back. Have they figured anything else out on that, Brother Cordell? Oh, all right. We'll keep praying for Miss Lynn then as well and her 
back issues from that car accident. <clears throat> it's no fun having back pain. And so let's pray, and uh, we'll get back into our lesson here. We can make sure all the teenagers get one because they weren't in here last week, so at least they can follow along with us today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much again for hearing and answering our prayers. Lord, thank you for being a great God. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with these requests this morning. Think of Joe's daughter. Lord, we've been praying for her for a while now, needing a kidney transplant. Lord, would you please work that out? I pray that you would uh, just uh, give them strength and, and grace in their minds, Lord, as they're worried and concerned, and, and we understand that. And uh, God, I just pray that you'd work all of those details out. I pray for Brother Cordell uh, and his heart surgery coming up. And uh, Lord, again, we know that you are the great physician, and so God, we pray that you'd just flip the numbers, and uh, it wouldn't be anything that would be life-threatening or anything like that. God, uh, we love Brother Cordell and his family, and uh, Lord, we, we feel like we need him here. And so I just pray that you'd uh, work those details out with Miss Lynn and her back uh, and everything that she's dealing with from the car accident. God, I pray that you'd help both of them, strengthen them physically, emotionally, and all the devil tries to beat us up, Lord, when we're when our bodies are hurting and not working right. And so, God, I pray that you'd help them. Pray for Rick, Lord, that you would, again, we're just asking for a miracle. And uh, whatever that might be, Lord, we pray that you would do it. Pray for grace and strength for the family. And uh, Father, other requests, unspoken requests that could be mentioned, we pray that you'd help with those and get involved in those. And uh, God, you're, you're, a, you're just a great God. You're a wonderful God. I don't mean to just reuse the same words, but I don't know what else to say. Lord, my vocabulary is not big enough to describe and glorify you. And uh, God, you're just amazing. And I love you this morning. I know we love you and we're very thankful for all that you've done for us. And we pray that you would just continue to be at work in our lives. May we not miss it. May we see it, be aware of it, be thankful for it. And I pray that we'd be a testimony about it to those around us in Jesus name. Amen. All right. If you've got the lesson, turn to first Corinthians chapter nine. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, Use one of those in the chair there so you can follow along with us. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, turn over there. We'll read our verses again, and we'll review a little bit, or we'll review what we covered last week, which we didn't get far into the outline, but we'll hit that for those that weren't in here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we started last week talking about spiritual discipline. We talked about self-discipline, self-control. What is self-discipline? Very simple, it's disciplining yourself. Paul said it this way, we'll look at the verse I think later on, but Paul said, I bring my body under subjection. Uh, a lot of people are controlled by their desires, they're controlled by their uh, their cravings, if you will. Um, how, many of you ever, how many of you get up and eat midnight snacks? Anybody? All right. Um, sometimes those, <laughs> you were the only one that raised your hand, so I'm just going to talk to you. <laughs> no, uh, those midnight snacks, you know, we get up and it's, we have a craving in the middle of the night. And what do we do? We go fulfill that. And there's nothing sinful about that. But listen, if we get up in the middle of the night and eat a half a gallon of ice cream and, and a hoagie and order a cheesesteak and a pizza, uh, we might have a problem <laughs> um, in the middle of the night. And so we want to make sure that our cravings, our desires, whatever that might be, physical, emotional, doesn't matter. We want to make sure those things aren't controlling us. And so self-discipline is I'm in control of me. I'm in control of my desires. Yeah, I'd like to have uh, a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts, hot, fresh, right off the wheel, but I'm not going to allow myself to eat a dozen of them. I sure could. And I'm not going to say I have, haven't. But, uh, you know, it's not good for me. And so having one is one thing. Eating 12 uh, is a whole other ball game. And so self-discipline is really what this is all about. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we'll begin reading in verse number 24. Paul said, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. We talked about this last week. Uh, everybody's running. We're all, as Christians, we're all in this race of Christian, Christianity, the Christian life. Jesse's running a race, and Rock is running a race, and Camise is running a race, and Miguel is running a race, and Miss Rose is running, and I'm running a race. We're all running a race, and it's not a race against each other. Listen, we're not in Christianity to find out who can be the better Christian. It's not me against you and you against me. I'm running against life. I'm running against uh, temptations. I'm running against the flesh, the world, and the devil, the things that are trying to trip me up in my race. 
in my uh, in the life that God's given me to live. And so we want to be careful that we don't look at each other like, well, I'm a better Christian than them, or or that person's a better Christian than me. And and there's plenty of people that we could look to and say, man, they they are closer to God than I am. And it shouldn't be something that we look at and go, well, I could never attain that level, so I'm just not even going to try. No, I'm running my own race. And uh, Brother Weedo's been saved a lot longer than me. He's been doing this a lot longer. So he, he ought to, by spiritual maturity, he ought to be a better Christian than me. But it's not about that. It's about how close I am to God and me disciplining myself. So we're all running the race. And then he says in verse 25, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. That's our word that means self-discipline or self-control is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. We talked about that last week, but I keep under my body. And bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so we we began last week, and we talked about how, especially in American society, we are a we are a self indulgent nation. We are a self indulgent society. If I want it, I'm getting it. Whatever that indulgence might be, whether it's food, I think I've given this illustration before. Uh, there was a pizza buffet in the town I grew up in called Godfather's Pizza, and uh, we'd go in there for the lunch buffet from time to time. And I watched a lady walk in there one time. It was kind of cafeteria. You'd go in and you'd pay, and you'd get one of those cafeteria trays, and you'd put your plate on it, your salad plate, your pizza plate, your silverware, your cup, and you'd move down the line. And then there would be the pizza. Well, I saw this lady get her tray, get all of her stuff, plates and everything, went to the table without getting anything, set the plates and the cups down, took the tray back to the buffet, and filled the tray up with pizza. And initially I thought, and that's a genius move right there. Why have I never thought of that? But that is what we're, <laughs> right? That's that self-indulgent, you know? The plate that they give me that'll hold three or four slices isn't enough, so I'm going to take the tray back and put two whole pizzas on it. That's self-indulgence. That's lack of self-control. And whether we're talking about food, whether we're talking about electronic devices, whether we're talking about some new toy, barbecue grills, sorry. I'm sorry. Cause I'm the same way. <laughs> I love it. Rock. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, it doesn't matter what your, what your toy might be. We got to make sure that we're practicing and exercising some self-control. And so, uh, we live in an indulgent, indulgent society, but that shouldn't be the mark of a Christian. Uh, we need to practice discipline. And so then we started. Roman number number one, if you're filling out the outline, Roman numeral number one was the purpose of discipline. What is the purpose of discipline, of self-discipline? A purpose is this. It's an intention. Uh, I know Jesse likes to work out. And so what is Jesse's purpose for working out? Is he trying to bulk up? Is he trying to, to, to lose weight? Is he just trying to be in good shape? There's a purpose or an intention behind him working out. And so whatever that purpose is or that intention is determines for him how and when and what he chooses to do at the gym. And uh, if you're trying to lose weight, you may go run on the treadmill or you may ride the bike. If you're trying to bulk up, then you're going to lift weights. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of different purposes. And so you discipline yourself to go do the things that are going to meet the intended purpose. Does that make sense? Same thing spiritually. Well, what is our purpose then for spiritual discipline? We read it first. Letter A is this. It's to run the race. Verse number 24, know ye not that they which run in a race run all. We are, Again, we're all in this race of the Christian life. And so what do you want to do with the race? Do you want to run the race or do you want to lose the race? It's not a matter of I'm, I'm just not going to be in the race. No, when you got saved, you automatically got in the race. You became a Christian. You became a soldier. You became a, a runner, if you will, since we're talking about that analogy, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want to lose. And I hate losing. And I lose to my flesh more often than I'd, I'd care to admit to you. Uh, you know, losing my temper or, or, or whatever it might be. There's, there's things that I struggle with, just like there's things that we all struggle with. And I, I, it bugs me 
It irritates me to struggle with the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I want to beat that thing. And I want to win that particular area of my race. And so what do we, what's the purpose of discipline? Well, it's to run the race. We're in it. We might as well do the best we can. If I'm going to play the game, I want to be the best at it than I can be. Yesterday, we played a little bit of basketball out here in the, uh, in the park. We've got a group here from Texas this week, and uh, you'll see them later. They're all over at Bible Baptist right now. Uh, but some of those boys wanted to go over there and play some basketball, and so I went over there with them, and uh, there were three or four guys out there playing ball. And so I got out there, and uh, they're, like, they're like, can you play? I was like, not really. I just want to get out here and, and uh, sweat a little bit as if I needed to run around playing basketball yesterday to sweat. As soon as you walk outside, you were sweating. But anyway, felt like sweating some more. And uh, so I got out there, and Dylan, it was one of those mornings, one of those days when everything was clicking for me. I mean, everything I was putting up was dropping. And so some of those guys out there, they're looking at me like, who is this fat old white guy out here balling us? And I just, I never said anything. I'm, listen, if it's going right... Don't gloat. You just ball in. Give me the rock. Feed me while it's working, right? And, uh, man, I wanted to win. And we got down by about three points. And so Dale was on my team. And so I started posting up. It wasn't right because the the team we were playing, everybody was about a foot shorter than me. But I thought, I'm going to win. I'm 43. I'm chubby, to say the least. But I am going to win. And so I went down low, and I'm like, Dale, give me the ball. And I posted that kid up like four in a row, so we won. And uh, he's like, man, you're good. I was like, no, I just bullied you. That's all I did. (laughs) I'm not good. I just bullied you. But, hey, a win's a win, and I will take it. I hate losing. And uh, so we want to run this race, man. If we're in it and we are, then let's discipline ourselves to run it and run it well. And then we said, I think we got there, but letter B is this, to obtain the goal, to obtain the goal. The the ultimate reason for running the race is I want to win the prize. Paul said that I may win Christ. That's what he wanted to do. Uh, Listen, the objective in life is not the destination. The joy, somebody said this years ago, the joy is in the journey. I heard last week, I was listening to some podcasts by a preacher and he said, the will of God is not about the destination. It's about the journey with God on the way to the destination. That's uh, really walking with God is the destination. God's got a plan for you, Dylan and Zai and, and Miss Monique and Brother Cordell and, and all of us in here. God has a plan for you. But sometimes we can get so focused on what's God's will, what's God's will, what's God's will. We end up not walking with God. And really, God is the point. God is the destination. Uh, what did Jesus say to some of the disciples? It says he ordained 12 that they would or that they might be with him. And then it began to list out doing miracles, preaching, and all of the things that they would do. But the first thing in that list was he ordained them to be with him. That's the goal of the Christian life is to be with Christ. And if I choose to be with him, I obtain that goal, then whatever God's destination is for me, whatever God's will is for me, I'll reach it. I heard a preacher say this years ago, the man or the woman that walks with God always arrives at the destination. Whatever God's plan is for your life, you're not going to get there without walking with God. And so we want to obtain that goal. Verse number 24 in our text says this, so run that ye may obtain. Run that ye may obtain. What does it mean? So run that ye, run well. Run hard. Put some effort into it. Man, living for God is worth the effort and the work that it takes to get in it. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful life. And so spiritual discipline is not the end in itself, but it's the way of focusing our efforts on our race, on our race. What are some, you tell me, Let's, let's make a, a list here. What are some uh, spiritual disciplines that we should self-discipline ourselves to do or maybe not to do? Miss Monique. Read your Bible. Man, how does God communicate with us? Through the Word of God, whether it's reading, whether it's through preaching. But, man, God gave, I think everybody in this room has a Bible. 
And uh, so we need to be in there. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. That's a spiritual discipline. Some days, Miss Monique, I wake up and I don't feel like reading my Bible. But I make myself do it because, one, it's the right thing to do. One, I want to hear from God. And so I'm going to do it. Appetites are created. Appetites are created. The more I eat ice cream, the more ice cream I'm going to want. True or false? They say about vegetables, the more you eat vegetables, the more you want. I have yet to figure that one out. You know, I've tried vegetables two or three times in my life, and it just doesn't appeal to me. Uh, I read this, I, my mom sent me a picture this week. Um, it said celery, when you want to eat water with hair in it. That's what celery is. I have zero desire to eat celery. But if the theory holds true, and we know that it does, if I ate celery, I would end up creating an appetite in me for celery. Well, spiritually, if I'll read the Bible, some people say, well, it's hard to read the Bible. I don't understand. Listen, you got you to gotta create that appetite, and you create that by reading it, reading it often, reading it consistently, make a habit. And so a spiritual discipline we ought to have is reading the Bible. What's another one we ought to have? Prayer. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bible is how God talks to us. Prayer is how we talk to him. And so we ought to have a consistent, regular time and, and, and life, if you will, of prayer. Tom Williams said this years ago, many Christians have a prayer time. Very few Christians have a prayer life. And that's just that constant attitude of prayer. I'm walking with God everywhere I go, not just for a set time in the mornings. And so we want to pray. Brother Frank, I saw your hand. Witnessing. Witnessing. Let's be honest, how many of us feel like every single day of our life getting up and talking to total strangers about Jesus? It's not a natural desire in us, but that desire is created. The more people we talk to about the Lord, we come across people who are interested, who do desire to have a, or are looking for the truth, and then it becomes enjoyable. We create it, but we've got we've to work at that. Head. We've got to discipline ourselves. This is what God wants me to do, so I'm going to do it. So there's just a few, and we could go around and, and name a lot of different things. And so you keep adding to that list as we go through the lesson, but we're doing that so that we can run the race, so that we can run the race. All right, now, uh, let's take our Bible and go to Philippians chapter 3. We'll come back to 1 Corinthians. But if you go over to Philippians chapter 3, 1 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. And I mentioned the verse a moment ago, but let's see what Paul says. Philippians chapter 3, the goal is Christ, not necessarily the destination, but the goal is the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul said, let's begin reading verse number 8, Philippians chapter 3, yea, doubtless, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul said, I, I, I willingly lose, suffer the loss of, of popularity, suffer the loss of position in this world. Paul was a, a trained Pharisee. He could have become the high priest. He could have been uh, probably anything with his education and his bloodline and his training. He said, you know what? I don't care about any of that. The main goal of my life is I want to win Christ. Verse number 10, that I may know him that I may know him. Ask yourself this this morning. How well do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? How well do you know him? There are people in this room that we know well. There are others in this room we may not know so well. So we understand what that means, to know him. It's not just knowing facts about him. It's not just knowing or having knowledge about him. It's knowing him. You know, I've used the illustration for years. I, I had much knowledge about Michael Jordan growing up. I knew facts. I knew stats. I knew, I knew all kinds of things about Michael Jordan, but I never knew him. And he didn't have a clue who I was. And so there's a big difference between knowledge about someone and knowing them. And Paul said, I want to know him. Listen, I want to know him. That is the goal. This is the goal that God has in mind for all of us. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 says this, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, 
that he might be the firstborn among, firstborn among many brethren. God's goal for you is to be like Christ. God's goal for me is to be like Christ. And we have to discipline ourselves in some things in order to reach the goal. It takes work to know the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's well worth the work. Man, when you're, you're going through something and God begins to speak to you yesterday, I was praying and, uh, you know, I just asking the Lord for something from the word of God. I said, God, just, just give me something. I don't care what it is. You know, I'm not looking for uh, wisdom for a specific decision. I just want to, I want you to speak to me. And uh, within just a couple of minutes of reading, and I'm reading in Jeremiah right now, which isn't necessarily the most enjoyable book to read. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah is, he's very discouraged. There's a reason he's called the weeping prophet. So it's not the most joyful book. But God gave me, within just a few minutes, God gave me three specific verses and, uh, and spoke to me directly about something specific. And I was like, man, God answered my prayer. It's, it's enjoyable to walk with God when you know God speaks to you and you're seeing God feed you. And man, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And so you want to keep doing that. A disciplined runner doesn't gripe and complain about what they have to eat or what the work is that they have to put in. They don't complain about that. They do it because they're focused on the prize. I want to win. Those Olympians, they want to win that gold medal. So they put in the work, and it doesn't bother them to put in the work. Well, how, much, how bad do you want to know Christ? And so the purpose is to know Christ. It's to run the race and obtain the prize. Number two, Roman numeral number two. Let's talk about the practice then of discipline, the practice of discipline. Go back to 1 Corinthians 9. Sometimes we, we have great intentions. We have very good intentions. Man, I, you ever hear preaching, Jesse, and you think, man, I need to do that. I need to add that to my life. And we have every intention. Man, I've, I've taken notes. I've got notebooks and uh, the notes in the, in the margins of my Bible. I thought, man, I need to do this. I need to apply this to my, bi uh, to my life. And I have every intention of doing that. And, and I may even act on it for a while. And then what happens? We just get back into the routine of life. The routine of life. Change is, is hard for, for us. How many of you like change? Oh, great. I smile at people, they leave. I talk to them, they leave. I'm just going to pray and go back home so I don't offend anybody else and make you guys leave. <laughs> How many of you, what was my question? How many of you like change? Like you look forward to, I don't, I'm a creature of habit. There are some things that if it changes, I'm like, yeah, that's all right. There are other things I'm like, nah, no, I don't want to change. I, I, I like it the way it is. I like things the way they are. And so in, in some areas, we are not creatures of change, but change can be a good thing. Change can be a good thing, but we have to practice discipline in order to change those things. Don't come to church, hear something that God moves in your heart and says, Dylan, you ought to do this. I think, man, you're right. God, I, I want to do this. And then we don't do anything different. Brother Woodcock said it years ago. Um, a decision that doesn't change anything at home was just a good idea. I've had a lot of good ideas in my life, but I didn't put it into practice. First Corinthians 9, let's look at verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. That phrase, striveth for the mastery, means this. It means to enter a contest or to contend with the adversary. It's a choice. It's a choice. You're in the race, but you still have the choice to run or not to run. Now, if you choose not to run, you'll have no rewards. You'll have no uh, awards when, when you get to glory and see God one day. In fact, we'll be ashamed. We'll be ashamed before God the Father one of these days if we didn't run the race. But we're striving against an adversary. Well, who's the adversary? You? Me? Me? No, we're not running against each other. It's not that kind of a race, but there are things out there. There are adversaries that try to stop us. Don't turn over there, but 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 say, be sober or serious-minded, be vigilant, be aware, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You ever watched any kind of a, a video or National Geographic video about lions? stalking their prey do they ever just you know catch and release 
You know what catch and release is? Fishermen do it. It's just for the sport of fishing. You catch that fish, you take a picture for Instagram, and you let it go, right? Lions don't play catch and release. Lions attack and devour. That means they eat it, they eat it all. And if something else comes along to try to get in on the meal, the lions will attack them. No, no, I killed this animal. I'm going to eat it all. They don't have any self-control. Uh, <laughs> they don't have any self-discipline. No, they devour. Well, that's what the Bible says about the devil. He's a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And there are so many Christians in, in life that they're just not aware. They're not sober-minded. They're not vigilant. They're not looking around. They're not paying attention to the things that could trip them up and get them uh, attacked by the devil. And the devil looks for those. The devil looks for those, the ones that aren't disciplined, the ones that aren't vigilant. And it says in verse 9, resist whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. There's three ways that a Christian can practice self-discipline, all right? And so we don't want to be the one that gets devoured by the devil, and there have been many, all right? So we've got to put self-discipline into practice. Here's how we do it. Letter A, or first of all, temperate, it said in verse 25, temperate in all things, temperate in all things. That word temperate simply means to be self-controlled. It means to set aside anything that would harm in, the, in our analogy of a race or, or a runner or an athlete, it means to set aside anything that would harm the athlete in preparation for their event, if you will. And so we, we talked about Michael Phelps last week, Olympic swimmer. What does he do in order to win all those gold medals when he was, he was whooping the world in the, in the swimming pool? What did he do prior to that? He set aside things that would hinder him from being the best. There were, I guarantee you, there were things he did not eat. He spent hours a day in the pool, swimming, perfecting his technique, perfecting his, his swim moves, per, per, uh, perfecting the turns at each lap. Uh, he spent hours and hours putting in work and effort, and he set aside things that would hinder him. Here's what he didn't do. He didn't wear ankle weights in the swimming pool. Why? Because they would have slowed him down. They wouldn't have helped him. Sometimes football players, baseball players, basketball players, sometimes they'll wear ankle weights, and it may help them, but in the pool, uh, ankle weights aren't going to help. They're, they're not going to, they're going to hinder him. They're going to hinder him. So he didn't do some, some things. Uh, we, need to, we need to practice some self-discipline and be temperate. There are some things in this life that may not necessarily be sinful, but they aren't going to help me run this Christian race. Listen, I like to watch YouTube videos. I like Dude Perfect. I like, uh, there's a guy I like to watch, Dry Creek Wrangler School. And uh, it's, it's all about being a cowboy. And you say, that's weird. Uh, it's just me. I'm weird. What, I don't, you probably watch weird YouTube videos too. And so there's things I like to watch. But honestly, if I spend hours and hours and hours and hours watching YouTube videos, that is not going to make me a good Christian. You know, the average American today, I read this this week, the average American spends eight and a half hours a day on social media. Eight and a, I mean, a regular work day is eight hours. And the average American spends more than a work day on social media. Well, what is social media doing to our minds? There's lots of things on social media that are good, that are educational, that are entertaining, that are not sinful. And so we're not even going to talk about the, the things that are sinful, but are the things that aren't sinful, are they making you a better Christian, Brother Jesse? He likes to work out. So he probably follows some, some videos and some guys, some gurus on workout techniques. Nothing wrong with that. But if he reads his Bible for five minutes and watches eight and a half hours of, uh, of weightlifting videos a day, he's not going to be a good Christian. If we watch, uh, and I'm just saying, those things, they, in Hebrews, it says, laying aside the weights that doth so, uh, and the sin that doth so easily beset us. Some things are sinful. Some things just don't, they're not going to make me a good Christian. It's not a sin, but too much of it, it's like eating a dozen donuts every time you go to Krispy Kreme or Dunkin' or wherever, or out here on Sunday morning. I mean, there's plenty out there, but if I ate a whole tub full of pastries, it's not going to be very good for me. 
Moderation is the key. And so we do things or we leave things out. There ought to come a time in a Christian's life when, they, when we decide, I want nothing more than the power of God in my life. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to the point in your life when you think, man, I, I want God involved in every area of my life? I want the power of God. I want the touch of God. I want the leadership of God. I want the hand of God. That's, that's a goal that we ought to have. I mean, he paid for us. I want nothing more than to know Christ. And because of that, I'm willing to exercise temperance to gain these things. I'm willing to say no to some things in order to know him. Have we ever been there? Um, it's not that, that folks, we live in a, it's called today, it's called the Laodicean age. That's the, the church age that we live in, if you will. And uh, many Christians are just lukewarm, just lukewarm. They're not really against God and against spirituality. They're just not interested in being that spiritual. You know, I want to go to heaven and, and I want to I wanna have a relationship with God, Brother Frank, but, you, you know, th- there is a line. I don't want to be too Christian, you know? I don't want to be too right. I mean, if I'm, if I'm what God says, if I'm what the Bible says I'm supposed to be, then it's going to be a miserable life. I can't have any fun. I can't watch TV. I can't listen to, to, to music. I can't do this. I can't hang out with that person. No, no, don't look at the things that we can't do. Look at what God promises to those that walk with him. This book is full of blessings that God says, if you put me first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? Food, shelter, clothing, raiment, blessings. He daily loadeth us with benefits, which means desserts. Man, God is good to people who put him first. But the people who are like, eh, you know, God, you're up there on the list, but, but you're not first. How many of us have been there? I've been there. The average Christian knows more about sporting events than the message they heard preached last Sunday. And I'm not even going to ask if any of us remember what pastor preached last Sunday morning or Sunday night. Anybody know what he preached Sunday night? We didn't have church Sunday night. <laughs> I see some people going, come on, come on, come on. We didn't have any church. We had a testimony service last Sunday afternoon, <laughs> right? Uh, what? And again, I'm not, listen, that's me too. That's me. There, there are some messages that I can remember and then there's others, I'm like, if you asked me what, what, what I heard Thursday night in church, I'd be going, the Bible, right? That grade school answer. <laughs> Jesus is the answer to everything. The preacher preached about Jesus. <laughs> yes, he did. Uh, but more specifically, Miguel, what did he preach about? Hey, if we know more about what's going on in the world around us, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have some knowledge about what's going on around us, but we have less memory or less knowledge of God, then we're not being temperate. We're not being temperate in all things. And so that is the goal, is to be temperate in all things. And then, hang on, I got my pages out of order. Un momento, por favor. Letter B, purposeful in all things purposeful. I used to say it all the time. Live life on purpose. Live life on purpose. Too many of us, myself included, we just kind of live day to day and whatever life throws at me, I react to that. Instead of leaving the house in the morning with a goal and an intention and a purpose to be like Christ, to account, I'm going to hand out, you know, living on purpose means grab a stack of tracks and say, I'm going to give out 15 tracks every single day. And I'm not, I'm not going home. I'm not going to bed. D.L. Moody, I believe it was, said he, was, he wasn't going to go to sleep until he had witnessed and given the gospel to at least one person every day of his life. And there were days he'd get in for the night and he'd start getting ready for bed and he'd think, I hadn't witnessed anybody. And he'd get dressed and he'd go out and find somebody and tell them the gospel. That's living life on purpose. We make little decisions uh, to, do some, to do something and accomplish something. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 says this, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Hey, remember we did that last week. We're not just, 
We're not just running around fighting like this. We're not fighting a, 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 a physical battle, uh, but we've got we've to do things intentionally on purpose. Uncertainly, he says, I don't run uncertainly. I know what I'm doing. I'm running intentionally. I'm running purposefully. The, the Apostle Paul was not running as uncertainly. He had a purpose. He had a goal. What is your goal in life? What is your goal day to day? I've read books and people say you need to have a 10-year plan and a five-year plan and a two-year plan and a one-year plan and a six-month plan and a one-month plan and a two-week plan and a one-week plan and a one-day plan and a one-hour plan. You say, that's a lot of planning. It is, but those people accomplish the most because they're living on purpose. If you want to be somewhere or something in five years, that starts today. You're not just going to be that on accident. That means what am I going to do in order to get there five years from now? What do I, what do I got to do today? Well, break the day down. What do I got to do right now to accomplish this day the way I want? And we're thinking spiritually, okay? And this can apply to a lot of areas, but we're, we're talking spiritually. I want to be the best Christian I can be. So what can I do today to live on purpose intentionally to be like Christ? And I make those decisions. Anybody who would have come into contact with Paul would obviously have known Paul was all about the Lord Jesus Christ. He told everybody. If you had met the Apostle Paul, you would have known, huh, this guy is one of those crazy Christians. He, he's, he's a psycho for Jesus. Well, hey, that's, that's really, that's what we all ought to be. And so he lived on purpose. And then the third thing today, and we'll finish up, is controlled. How to, how to be, uh, how to, to practice self-discipline is to be controlled. In all things, verse number 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. That phrase, I keep under my body, it's literally a boxing term. We like to watch boxing, at least I do. It means to, to buffet one's body as a boxer is beaten black and blue. That means I'm going to beat my flesh into submission instead of letting my flesh beat me. I'm going to control this. I'm not going to overeat. I'm not going to, to indulge in, in fleshly appetites. I'm not going to watch that on YouTube. I'm not going to listen to that because that is not going to make me a better Christian. I am going to control my flesh. And that's where a lot of Christians today, that's where a lot of people are at. They have no self-control to be controlled. Listen, painful choices will have to be made in order to live a disciplined life. Painful choices. You're going to have, if you want to live this life, you're going to have to choose to get rid of some things. You're going to have to choose to do some things that initially are probably going to hurt. The first time I, I, I got a gym membership not too long ago, and the first time I went to work out, it was great. Me and Kale went, and we lifted weights, and I had no issues. And then the next day, I was like, I was dumb. But the second day after that, I thought, I hate Kale. Kale's a jerk. We worked tries that day. And I, this is it. That's it. That's all I could do. Anything past that, forget it. I didn't wash my hair. Couldn't get my hands up there. I'm just like, not happening. Why? Because it hurt. My arms hurt, my legs hurt, my body hurt. Listen, if we're going to be self-controlled, we're going to have to make some painful decisions. But the benefit after the pain is far greater than the pain of making that decision. And so really it boils down to this. What do you want to be? What do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do? Do you want to be a good Christian or do you want to be a bad Christian? You see, if you've been saved... You're saved. You're a Christian. Now, everything you do, every decision you make determines whether you're a good Christian or a bad Christian. When I got married, uh, we got married, and uh, we said our vows to one another, and now our life is every decision I make in marriage either determines whether I'm a good husband or a bad husband. I'm a husband. I'm a husband. But the things I do determine if I'm a good one or a bad one. I'm saved. The choices I make, the things I do, determine if I'm a good Christian or a bad Christian. Or we could say it like this, we're the sons of God, the daughters of God as Christians. I'm either a good son or daughter, 
or I'm a bad son. I'm a son. Some of you are daughters. Just, just clarifying. We live in a weird world. Uh, I'm either a good son or a bad son. What kind of son or daughter to God do you want to be? Nobody in their right mind really wants to live their life and go, I want to disappoint God every day because that's just great. It's lots of fun to get up and do it my way and God be disappointed in me. No, we don't want to do that. But we've got to make some decisions. We've got to do some things on purpose, controlled and intentional in order to be that good son or daughter to God. All right, let's pray. We'll finish that lesson next week. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the lesson time this morning. Thank you for each one that was here. And Lord, we pray that, that you were able to work. I pray that you used the, the Word of God and, uh, and the principles from the Word of God to help us be self-disciplined, help us to have some self-control, some spiritual self-control. Lord, maybe we need some physical self-control, but whatever it was that you wanted to speak to each individual about, Lord, I pray that you were able to do that. May we hear and listen, not just have some good ideas today, but may we go home and be different, change the things that are necessary. Bless the rest of the services today, all that's going on in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can be dismissed. There is coffee and juice and some pastries out here. We've got about 10 minutes. Uh, remember, don't bring any food or drink back in here. Eat it out there if you want it, uh, but help yourself. There is plenty out there.